Hello folks, my name is Rick Pearson and this is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. Today's presentation is different from any other we've done in the past, so stay tuned, you don't want to miss this new format. Welcome back, folks. Before we begin our program, we'd like to invite you to join Karen and myself every Thursday at 7 p.m. EST for our Bible Study Podcast live chat. You can join in and ask us any questions that you want in that chat. Just go to www.prophecyusa.org or our YouTube channel and send us your email, and we can send you a link every week just to remind you of the Bible Study. You know, in the past years, most of our TV programs have been done in both our TV and our podcast studios, utilizing direct teaching, questions and answers, or conversations with my wonderful wife, Karen. However, today, we're doing something totally different. Recently, I was asked to speak at the Flame the Fire Conference in Bradenton, Florida. My host, Pastor Phil Durstein, told me he wanted me to take as much time as needed and give my full teaching on America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, that message lasted close to two full hours of nonstop teaching. And at the end of the meeting, almost 50% of the audience bought a book or a study guide, and many came up and thanked me for being so detailed in delivering such a sobering revelation of where we are on God's prophetic time clock. Now, because the meeting went so well, I thought I would share it with you, our TV audience. So if you have never been to Florida, I would like to welcome you to Bradenton Christian Retreat's Family Church for Prophecy USA's first teaching seminar in this great country that we call the United States of America. And you are there. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. You can be seated. I've known for, uh, Phil for 50 years, and so are you, and we still have hair. So that is an amazing feat. And I also know uh, Brother Maurice. I met Maurice um, 1993. I went to a, a Rodney Howard Brown conference in Lakeland, and somebody asked me if they would give, if, Maurice, if I could give Maurice a ride home to the hotel. And I said, sure. And in the car, Brother Maurice was a little nervous. And he said, you know, several, several months ago, I had a vision. And I told my pastor about it. And my pastor said, uh, don't tell anybody, uh, Maurice. But he said, I really feel like I should be telling you this vision. So he told me the vision. And he saw America. And he saw flames all over America. And then the Lord spoke to him and said, it's Babylon. It's Babylon. He says, does that mean anything to you? And I said, yes, it does. I happen to be writing a book right now called Babylon Rising. That book is right there, published in 1999, sold over 12 copies worldwide. <laughs> and it's, still, it's been flying off the shelf, but we discontinued. We sold one more last summer, and we discontinued it, and we replaced it with this one. The Hour That Changes Everything, number one bestseller on Amazon in Canada and the U.S., it's a book that has 265 pages and 258 footnotes. It was co-written by Wayne Hastings, who was one of the 75 authors uh, from Thomas Nelson, who published the New King James Bible. And when Wayne did five commentaries on the book of Revelation, word-by-word -word studies, he got done my book, and he said, Rick... I have never seen the dots joined like you just joined them. And he is convinced that the United States of America is in Bible prophecy. So I want to tell you something. When you get this book, this book 
is theologically rock solid. But it goes against traditional thinking. But it's rock solid theologically. There's a saying, uh, if you don't know where somebody's coming from, you don't know where they're going to. So I want to give you a brief background of who I am and where I've come from. When I was seven years old, I walked down the aisle of a Baptist church and I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. I was raised in a church of cessation theology. That says that miracles don't happen any day. And I lived by the five cardinal rules. I don't drink, don't smoke, don't swear, don't chew, and don't you date a girl that do. And if I figured if I could just maintain three of those, I'm in. But by the time I was 18, I was kind of looking at maybe adding another two more. And I started searching for a university to go to. I went to Oral Roberts University. I saw it on television uh, with my cousin, Bill Pearson. And I learned at Oral Roberts University that God still does miracles. And he actually speaks to people today, right now. Oral Roberts was called to raise up your students to hear my voice go where my power is not known, my voice is heard small, and my light is dim. And that God still, I thought, what a concept. God does not change yesterday, today, and forever. And so we went to that university at 18 years old, and then we continued our journey, and we went to Florida to Clearwater. And in an apartment in Florida, I decided I was going to make a vow to this God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Oral. And I said, if you're up there and you're real, if this thing is real, I will do anything you want me to. I will go into any jungle, but any place ever, but I have to know that you are real. When I released that vow, the door of the apartment blew open and a wind came into the room and encircled me. Both me and my cousin looked at each other and we buried our face in the carpet. I said the name Jesus, Jesus over and over again because I wondered what on earth have I conjured up. <laughs> and as I said the name Jesus over and over again, I started speaking in another language. And as I spoke in another language, a still small voice said to me, Son, you will share this experience with other people that do not believe in my power nor my existence. At that point, I said, God, I don't know what's going on, but please stop the wind. And the wind left the, the room, and the door slammed behind it. I did not know that Ezekiel went up in a whirl, or not Ezekiel, but um, Elijah went up in a whirlwind. I didn't know that a, a whirlwind came and spoke to Jonah. I didn't know that Ezekiel had a whirlwind come down, and God spoke to him. And I didn't know that on the day of Pentecost... And it came, they were gathered together with one accord, all the disciples, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled the room where they were at, and they began to speak in over 15 languages, the 15 dialects of, uh, of the people that were around there, praising God in other languages. I didn't know any of that was in the Bible. The United Nations has a 2030 agenda. The World Economic Forum has a great reset. The COVID-19 pandemic has an accelerated mandate. But as the new world order plans their world without God, nothing will be accelerated faster than the prophetic word God has spoken to the United States of America. It will be the hour that changes everything. Prophecy USA is proud to present their latest book, The Hour That Changes Everything, together with our study guide and free app, Prepare yourself for one of the greatest events in Bible prophecy. Go to prophecyusa.org or call the number on your screen now to make your donation of $35 or more and receive your copy of the book, The Hour That Changes Everything. We are waiting to hear from you. Call today. From 73 to 77, I went to ORU. I graduated from ORU and I wanted to be a pilot I wanted to fly missionaries, and I wanted to do something in God's work. But that didn't work out. They wouldn't let me stay in the States, and I had to go back home and work for my father in a little town of 3,000 people at a job I didn't want to do. 
Don't ever tell God that you won't work for somebody, live in a certain town and do a certain job. You'll spend the rest of your life doing that, okay? In 1986, a phone call rang. Nine years of working for my dad, the phone call rang, and they wanted me to come to, to ORU to see if I would be interested in being a regent. I went to ORU uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I sat there on a board of people who had, were giving their lives to God. They were full-time ministry, and here I was sweeping out buses for my dad, making money, and I wasn't even tithing. And the Bible says in Malachi 3.10, Will a man rob God? You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. And I said, Lord, I am sorry. So I took 10% of my net worth, and I gave it to medical missions, and when I did that, something happened to me. Something supernatural happened, just like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius, an angel came to him and said, your tithes and offerings have come up for a memorial, Cornelius. Go to Peter and he'll show you the, the way to salvation. The first Gentile that ever got saved was visited by an angel. The same thing happened to me for a period of seven days. As I released that money, I had words flowing through my mind all for a full week sentences and I could not get them out and it was all about the United States of America in Bible prophecy. It was to the point where I thought I was losing my mind until on the seventh night of the seventh day an audible voice woke me up, called me by name, and I said, why are you calling me Lord? And he said, because I love you Rick and I want you to have fruit that remaineth. John 15, 16 says, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. I was so rattled by this experience from what I saw coming that I slept for three weeks with my Bible on my chest and I begged God, please don't let me lose my mind. Something's really wrong with me. And I jumped on a plane and I flew to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I asked Oral Roberts to personally come and lay his hands on me. Bob Deweese, somebody said, what do you think's wrong? I said, a lot. So Brother Roberts graciously met with me. He laid his hands on me. I shared briefly with him what happened in the apartment in Clearwater. He laid his hands on me. I started to shake, and he started to laugh. And I was offended, and I, and I looked at him, and he said, no, 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 Rick, I'm not laughing at you. He said, you have heard from God. You're very close to your calling. You're very close to your calling right now. And I said, Brother Roberts, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my mind. And he said, you are not going to lose your mind. We're going to put you on this board, and you're going to have a covering. And for the next 21 years, I sat on the board of regents, on the executive board of seven men, to run Oral Roberts University. Now, I, could, I would go back home to my small town, and I would teach what I felt God had shown me. And what tonight you're going to learn is 35 years of studying. I live in a small town. I moved from my one little town of 3,000 people where I didn't want to live, Tilbury, and I moved to a place called Brantford. Brantford has a population of 100,000, and I had Bible studies and taught at church. I drew crowds as many as five and six people to my Bible studies. <laughs> In 2008, uh, I decided I got out of the business. We sold our business, and I was going into retirement, and I flew down to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I, and I went to Oral Roberts' house, and I told Brother Roberts, I sold my business. I'm going into retirement. He said, Rick, why are you doing that? You're right in your prime. And I said, Brother Roberts, I think that season's over in my life. And Brother Roberts went like this, and he said, Now listen to me, Rick. Don't you get ahead of God. He will open a door for you, and when it opens, you will know. And sometimes it'll be easy, and sometimes it'll be hard. But you're going to have to decide to walk through that door. I said, okay, Brother Roberts, thank you very much. Brother Roberts died about six months after that. In 2015, I received an honorary doctorate of laws degree from Canada Christian College for my years of volunteer work on boards and missions and churches. In 2017, they called me up 
and said, hey, Rick, we're going to Israel, and we want you to come. And I listened to the invitation. I thought, I've been to Israel four times. I've been baptized four times in the Jordan River. I think I'm in. I don't want to go to it, but thank you so much. And three days later, the Lord said, go to Israel. I said, okay. I called them back. Okay, I'm going to go to Israel. I was in Israel, and we toured. It was a great tour, but I met a man in Israel in a swimming pool, Dr. Rod Hembray from Bible Discovery TV. And I, we, we were talking about prophecy, and of course, I start bloviating. I can go forever about prophecy. And he listened to me, and he says, you know, my dad used to talk like this. Now, now Rod Hembray had been on television for 30 years with his father. They came from the Rex Humbard ministry. And Rod and I were in the swimming pool, and Rod took off and swam down in the deep end, and he said the Lord spoke to him and said, Rod, I want you to build Rick a TV studio. I want you to give him your staff. I want you to give him your cameras. I want you to give him all your expertise. I want him to write a show, and I want him to produce it, and I want you to do everything for free. <laughs> so Rod called me about three weeks later, and he told me this. And I thought, well, the price is right. <clears throat> but do I want to go on national television and teach this? And I remember Brother Robert saying, sometimes it's easy, Rick, and sometimes it's hard. And then I remembered my vow in the apartment, and I said, I'm in. And that was three years ago on March of 2019, we began our show. Three weeks before our show began, Dr. Jack Van Empe died, and NRB gave me his spot. So I went from a Bible study to national television on NRB and across the nation. We're on about 120 stations now, and I begin my show every week with... Uh, Hi, this is Rick Pearson, or my name is Rick Pearson. This is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. And this meeting tonight is a meeting specifically designed to unveil your role in Bible prophecy. Gene Bailey of Flashpoint said to me, um, you're a guy from Canada. What, what are you doing with a TV show called Prophecy USA? And I said, Gene, if God calls you to go to Nineveh, don't go to Tarshish. Because you might end up on a three-day Mediterranean all-you-can-eat cruise. So I am being obedient to the best of my ability. 4,000 years ago, an antichrist religion was birthed in ancient Babylon. Yet Joshua overcame it, Gideon overturned it, Elijah overwhelmed it, and Josiah overthrew it. This vile religion demands a rejection of God's commandments, a defiance of God's morals, a resurgence of asterisk poles with rampant immorality, and the shedding of innocent blood that cries out for judgment. These are the signs of a nation seduced by Baal worship. But what is the answer? 2,000 years ago, innocent blood was shed for you. But will America come back? Will she seek God's forgiveness or will she suffer His judgment? Prophecy USA proudly presents a study guide addressing America's spiritual state of the union concerning her past, present, and future role in Bible prophecy. Call right now with your donation of $20 or more to receive your copy, 1-888-306-1759. Or go online to prophecyusa.org right now. The purpose of prophecy is for God to keep His promises to His children, and those promises are already written in Scripture. Amos said, Surely the Lord will do nothing except He reveal His secrets unto His servants the prophets. Moses said, The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things He revealed unto us belong to us and to our children. Who are His children? John 16, 13 says, When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. For my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Prophecy is a done deal. Isaiah prophesied, I am God, and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient of times, the things that are not yet done. I will do my pleasure. 
For I have spoken it, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will do it. Jeremiah 1.9 says, I'm watching over my word to perform it. You notice he's not watching over my word and my vision and my dream or your word and your vision and your dream. He's watching over his word. Never, never, never base your theology on somebody else's vision, dream, or word. Now, why is that? Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they be of God. Moses wrote, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. And thou shalt not be afraid of him. Galatians says, if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself and not in another. R.W. Shambrock said, some are sent and some just went. God warns there will be prophesiers and prophesiers. But we are admonished to despise not prophecy. God speaks through imperfect vessels. Do you know why that is? Because he has no other choice. <laughs> Think about that. The prophets aren't perfect. And neither are you. So there's three things that we have to remember. There is a God, I'm not him, and neither are you. <laughs> he has spoken it, he will do it, he has purposed it, and he will bring it to pass. So today we're not going to hear my rhema word. We're going to unveil the secret things already spoken in God's written word. Through the prophets of Moses' law, Isaiah's vision, Jeremiah's word, Daniel's dream, Ezekiel's prophecies, and John's revelation. God does not need anyone's permission, approval, nor our endorsements to fulfill his word. He has spoken it. He will do it. He has purposed it. He will bring it to pass. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And at the end of this evening, my prayer is that you, like my friend Wayne, who helped me write this book, will discover the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. God does not necessarily tell us what we want to hear. He only says what he wants to say. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So let's begin our journey tonight. We're going to start with some traditional prophecy teaching with Daniel's interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream in 600 BC. We're now looking at traditional prophecy and everyone that teaches prophecy agrees with this. God removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and he revealeth the deep and secret things. In that dream, in Daniel chapter 2, he had an image of a man and Daniel interpreted that dream as a prophetic foretelling of six providential nations that would rise and fall in the future. He saw this image, a head of gold, which represented Babylon, a breast of silver, which represented Persia, thighs of brass, which represented Greece, legs of iron, which re represented East and West Rome, and a kingdom made of all the above by the ten toes. Forty years after that vision, Daniel has his own vision. He sees animals, and the animals represent the same kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar had. He sees a lion with wings, which represented Babylon of 600 BC. He saw a bear with three ribs in its mouth, representing Persia, which conquered Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. Those are the three bones in its mouth. He saw a leopard with four heads and four wings, which represented Greece, which deposed Persia. He saw a beast at the, at the bottom of the, uh, the diagram. The beast represented Rome, but then sometime in the future, all of those nations would come together and form a 10-nation conglomerate called the New World Order. In Revelation 13, 
John sees a beast and she rises from the sea of humanity. It's made up of the same animal nations described by Daniel. And John, 600 years after, sees all the same animals rising from the sea of humanity. In Revelation 17, this is the final vision that John has of the beast. But there's a woman on the beast. And this woman is named Mystery Babylon the Great. And that woman has traditionally been interpreted as occurring during the tribulation. The woman rides the beast throughout the tribulation period. This woman represents religious immorality, and she rides that beast all through the tribulation period. This is where Prophecy USA turns a corner from traditional prophecy. So what exactly is the tribulation? In the book of Revelation, it foretells the future of the last of the last days. Jesus said, for then shall come great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. We have never yet entered into the tribulation. Now, the book of Revelation is divided into several parts. Chapters 2 and 3, Jesus warns the believers before the tribulation comes. He warns them. He says to the church of Ephesus, you've lost your first love. He says to Sardis, you're full of dead works. He says to Smyrna, you're going to be persecuted. Pergamos and Thyatira have sexual immorality, and Laodicea has a problem with their money. But from chapter 6 through 16, this is where the tribulation is. Jesus opens the seven seals, and then the tribulation begins. There's four riders of the apocalypse that begin the tribulation. There's a one-world government, the beast, that is given power to rule during that tribulation period. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls of plagues released throughout that time. They have not been released yet. One-third of all vegetation, one-third of fresh water, and one-third of the sea gives forth the dead. One-third of mankind, mankind dies during the tribulation. There's 7.8 billion people on the earth. 2.2 billion people are going to die in a period of seven years according to Bible prophecy which is the, almost the population of the United States of America every year is going to die through all the calamities that are coming. There will be pestilence. There will be an asteroid called Wormwood. You do not want to be here for the tribulation. And as far as me and my wife are concerned, we have studied this and we are voting pre-trib rapture all the way. Okay? And I am a pre-trib rapture for anyone that's post-trib. There's the door. I don't want to talk to you. I get in arguments with people, and I have finally just said, listen, I agree with you. You are going to go through the tribulation. <laughs> well, folks, I trust you enjoyed our first live speaking engagement. And next week, we'll continue with that meeting right here in Bradenton, Florida, as we unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. This is Prophecy USA. My name is Rick Pearson reminding you that Jesus is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. Shalom.